This is a Columbia 75 video featuring Dr. J. Radhakrishnan speaking on his approach to acid-base disorders. So all the data you need are essentially present in either a venous or an arterial blood gas and a chemistry panel is required to calculate the anion cap and one cannot make the complete diagnosis unless you have all these together. Now uh, you could start by looking at the pH and if the pH is up alkalemia or is it down is it acidemia so that's the first question to ask question number two is what is the primary cause so is the CO2 up or down and is the serum bicarbonate up or down and once we establish the primary disorder we then say is the compensation uh, that is happening to offset this disorder occurring or not occurring and with this we make the diagnosis of a concomitant second or third disorder or not. What is the degree of compensation? And this has been uh, done experimentally. So there's a range of uh, compensation that accompanies every disorder. And this can be looked up in any acid-based chart, or you can go to one of the online calculators to see if this is a pure disorder or is it a mixed disorder. And the anion gap has to be looked at individually because you may have a wide anion gap with nothing else going on in the, uh, say, bicarbonate because of a complete balance situation. So if you have a very wide anion gap, uh, if it's over 20, we call this patient as being uh, possessing metabolic acidosis with gap. The ion gap is essentially composed of albumin. So serum albumin contributes between 2 to 4 uh, for every gram to the anion gap. And like I said, if, if no matter what else is going on, if your anion gap is over 20, there is a wide gap metabolic acidosis. So what are the examples of, uh, of metabolic acidosis with a wide anion gap? Uh, the way I look at this is to look at what acids can lead to an unmeasured anion. So we have lactic acid, which can be in the setting of hypoperfusion or with uncoupling of the oxidative phosphorylation chain. Then ketoacidosis can do this, for example, diabetes and uh, starvation ketosis or alcoholic ketosis. In kidney failure, there's a whole bunch of uh, anions, anionic acids that accumulate. Uh, for example, sulfuric acid, and this can cause an anion gap as well. And lastly, there are acids from ingestions, like methanol leads to formic acid accumulation, and ethylene glycol leads to oxalic acid accumulation. So in a patient with a wide gap acidosis, one should look at all these disorders to see what is clinically relevant in causing this gap acidosis. When you look at a gap being normal in the setting of metabolic acidosis, it implies that there's loss of bicarbonate. So whenever bicarb is lost, you gain hydrogen chloride, and since the bicarb will drop with hydrogen and the chloride will be higher because of addition of this compound, the gap does not change. So you can lose renal bicarbonate in the setting of any renal tubal acidosis, and in the setting of chronic diarrhea, you can lose GI bicarbonate. And these are the two main etiologies of um, a normal gap acidosis. And in the ICUs, for example, when patients are getting TPN, they get hydrogen chloride, uh, which is mixed with the TPN, to balance the dibasic amino acids to make the uh, pH neutral. So when the amino acids get metabolized, the HCl, hydrogen chloride, is left in excess and that can depress your bicarbonate. What really helps us in a patient with a normal gap acidosis is to look at the urinary anion gap. The urinary anion gap basically uh, tells us what is the distal nephron doing in terms of acid-base balance. So when you have a systemic acidosis, the kidney will respond by putting out ammonium, which binds the hydrogen in the distal nephron. So if there's something wrong with the distal nephron, for example, distal RTA or type 4 RTA, you will not get this wide anion gap because of a lack of ammonium chloride being produced. And if the gap is appropriately negative, it implies that there's an extra renal loss, for example, diarrhea, or there's proximal RTA. So just to recap, when you work up a patient with metabolic acidosis, you look at the gap. If it's wide, look at which acid is involved. Is it diabetes, is it lactate, is it kidney failure, or is it a poison? Gap is normal, look for a GI or a renal source of bicarbonate loss. Let's end up with metabolic alkalosis, and 
uh, right opposite to metabolic acidosis. If there's any um, loss of hydrogen through epithelia, it's going to lead to accumulation of bicarb on the blood side. So you may be having a patient with, say, pyloric stenosis who's vomiting, and they're losing hydrogen to the outside. Or you may have someone who is losing a lot of hydrogen in the kidney. And this is primarily because of an elevated level of aldosterone. Aldosterone drives in sodium and drives out potassium and hydrogen. So you're left with a relative lack of hydrogen, i.e. a metabolic alkalosis. And the third situation is when uh, acutely you're giving a lot of bicarbonate. This can be done in the setting of CPR or when the patient is being multiply transfused because of uh, citrate that's used as an anticoagulant. So why do the kidneys behave the way it is when, when, when the, in a patient who has alkalosis? The most important reason is hyperaldosteronism. So when someone is volume depleted, which is by far the commonest situation where you get persistent metabolic alkalosis, your aldosterone levels go up, you're absorbing sodium, and you're getting rid of hydrogen. And you're left with this excess bicarbonate on the blood side, which will never improve unless you take away the factors that leads to the elevated aldosterone level. So we can divide the treatment of metabolic alkalosis based on what's causing this elevated aldosterone. So in a patient who has, for example, um, a lot of volume depletion, um, all we need to do is to give intravascular volume back, and that will restore the aldosterone levels back to normal, and you are then able to get rid of this excessive bicarbonate. But there are patients who have um, effective intravascular volume depletion, for example, heart failure or those with cirrhosis and ascites. And in these patients, um, trying to give them saline is not going to work because you just get third spacing of the fluid, and it does not lead to restoration of intra-arterial blood volume, which is what drives aldosterone. So in these patients, and also in patients who have primary hyperaldosteronism, giving saline doesn't really help. So the way you would treat these patients is to essentially block the mechanisms associated with aldosterone excess leading to salt absorption, which is pyrinolactone, or using a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. And that is all I have to say about an approach to acid-based disorders.